Hello everybody, um, I'm Paul Baxter, I'm one of your um, parish councillors um, in Pueblo uh, with Pensford um, Parish and I'd like to talk to you uh, about neighbourhood planning. Um, now these are my views uh, on the neighbourhood planning process and the effect that it will have, um, although having said that they're not uninformed views. Um, I studied law uh, at a good college and I immediately after that went into development which I've been in for 15 years and I've specialised um, one way or another, in uh, getting planning commissions uh, by um, harnessing residential support. So I come up with applications that people like and then try and get those passed by using the fact that residents like. In order to talk about the effect the neighbourhood plan will have on planning law from your point of view, we're going to have to spend a little bit of time explaining how planning law works. Now, it's very complicated, um, deliberately so, I sometimes think, um, but it's, it's a case in law, like anything else, you put in your application and it's judged uh, through various legal sieves, if you like, and only the things that comply with those laws get passed. Now, within uh, the legal framework of this country, we have different layers of legislation. We have legislation made by the House of Commons and the House of Lords that the Queen then signs, and that's what we call primary legislation. And it governs everything. There is no higher authority. Then there are forms of legislation like bylaws and things like that which are created by local councils. Now they uh, have an authority but if they transgress primary legislation um, then they are null and void because the primary legislation takes precedence. Now in planning law the primary document is called the NPPF, it stands for National Planning Policy Framework and it was put in place by national government. And if you imagine the NPPF is like a colander. It's a sieve that has large holes in it. And what happens is, if as an individual you decide to apply for planning, and you can apply for planning on anything you like, you can apply on other people's land if you want, it's a freedom that you have because private property belongs to you, not the state. Your application to do whatever it is that you want to do essentially gets passed through the sieve of the MPPF. The only things that comply with the MPPF move on to the next stage of the process. If something is considered to be uh, against the law or against that piece of primary legislation, let's say you wanted to build a, a nuclear submarine or a missile silo or a, a ladder to heaven or something, um, you wouldn't get through the MPPF, it would be uh, illegal. The things that get through the MPPF, through the larger holes, the general guidance of the MPPF, then find themselves going through a second sieve, which is final, like this one here, and this would be the uh, local planning document. So this is one that's made by the local council, which refines the guidance given in the MPPF. So buildings that might well get through the general guidance of the MPPF may find themselves not getting through the more refined guidance of the local planning policy framework. And whatever gets through both sieves is then granted planning permission. That's a very simplistic guideline because, of course, there's green belt legislation and there's uh, conservation area legislation and listed buildings legislation. And all of these various sieves essentially stack up above one another and only the buildings that comply with all of them actually end up getting built. Um, the ones that fall foul of one rule or another uh, don't get through. Now obviously these sieves don't actually exist, and in truth the documents themselves are rather open-ended. You can have things you play off against one another. So for instance, if uh, um, restoring a listed building would cause um, you know, a problem with parking, it may be felt that restoring a listed building is more important than the problem with parking. And so there's a degree of balancing to be done, um, a degree of discretion has to be used. And the person who decides whether or not something complies with the National Policy Planning Policy Framework um, and the um, local plan is the planning officer. Um, you'll be allocated an officer if you apply. And they put the application through the test of the legislation, firstly through the National Planning Policy Framework and secondly through the local plan. And if they feel it complies, then they grant permission uh, for it to be built. Now, that's not it. Because running alongside that process, there's someone else who can put all that information through the legislation. And that's you. Any affected resident or group of residents is perfectly able to consider the legal um, 
benefits, if you like, of the application and form their own opinion. And as part of the planning process, you can write in and say, I feel that this application contravenes this part of the NPPF or that part of the NPPF. I feel that it's out of keeping with the conservation area. I feel it will damage a heritage asset or any other number of, uh, of legal objections. Um, objections you might write in that don't have a basis in law are pointless. So for instance, you have no right to a view. So if you say it's in my view, you may as well say that you're by -rowing. And the same is true of house price. The planning officer takes no account of house price uh, in their calculations at all. So only your complaints, if you wish to make complaints, which actually have a basis in law, will be considered. And it may be that as residents, you reach a different conclusion to the planning officer. So she may say, no, I'm not going to grant, but you may feel that you would like the application to be granted. Now, I know that's not usually the way that it goes, but it is possible. Um, now, what you would expect to happen if you uh, don't know much about planning is you would think that the officer would grant it or not grant it, and then you'd just have to be unhappy, but that's not true. If the residents disagree with the planning officer and the parish council are doing their job, uh, i.e. providing mouthpiece for those residents, then they would object to the application. So the residents' objections and the parish council's objection would be enough, often, for the planning officer's decision to be set aside and for the case to then go to committee. So there's these two sides to planning. There's the local side, where if you can get the parish council and the residents to agree that they're against an application, what will usually happen is if it's requested, the ward councillor will send it through to committee. Um, lots of councils have specific ways of going to committee. So for instance, if you get more than 10 objections, things like that, which personally I think are better because they take personality out of it. Baines isn't quite so good. Um, you have to, your ward councillor has to request it, um, or you can request it, or indeed the parish council can request it, and then it's up to the chair of the planning committee uh, whether or not it goes to committee. But if there's a, a point of law in question, or if there's a large number of people who are angry, or if there's a large development, it will often end up going to the committee. So the current system is, the planning officer makes their decision. But if you're bothered, if you, if you can motivate yourselves, you can also make a decision. Your parish council should or will usually support you. And if you have a desire to do so, you can then go to committee. So you have essentially the same power as the planning officer. Your, your views cancel one another out and it goes to a third party arbiter. And that's the current state of affairs. So the rights that you have in planning uh, are three, basically. You have the right to object to a planning application if you feel that it's a bad application. Uh, but as I say, if you want your objection to mean anything, you have to object uh, on legal grounds. You have the right to support. That's a really important right, but it's massively underused. People very, very rarely write in to support applications, but I think if you really wish to have more control over planning, you'll have to get used to that. And the last point that you have, and this is probably the most important one, is the right to apply. Um, private land is yours. You own it, you paid for it. And if you want to apply to build a missile silo, or whatever it is that you want to apply to build, you have the right to do so. Um, you write in and you say, I'd like to build this thing, and, and obviously that'll be turned down. Um, but if you make a reasonable request, an illegal request, then you have the right to have that request granted. Um, so planning, whilst the decisions are made by a number of different bodies, including um, residents, parish councillors and planning officers, and then there's highways and the Environment Agency and any number of others. It's driven by individuals. Everything that ends up in the system is put there because somebody has decided that they want to do something with their own private land and they're approaching the law um, looking for permission to do so. Um, so essentially the state has no desires um, or no specific desires uh, in planning. It's individuals who wish to build. Um, now that's not to say the state doesn't have any desires in planning at all, it has some very obvious desires, ones that the state is frequently, which is to build a great many more houses. Um, the government are hoping to build a quarter of a million uh, new houses in the upcoming year. Um, I believe they're going to build something like a million before 2020, which is just an extraordinary amount. You know, it's, a, it's a whole um, big city's worth of houses. Um, and the reason why they want to do that is because uh, you know, it would be good for them politically. You know, make a promise, it's nice to keep it. Um, and also you get community infrastructure levy per house, which um, amounts to billions and billions and billions of pounds. 
which obviously uh, they would like. So the government uh, is overtly and expressly in favour of doing lots and lots and lots and lots of building. Um, they believe we don't have enough houses, it's a significant need we want to meet it. And you can ask any cabinet officer and they'll tell you that. Residents, on the other hand, tend to look at things differently because, of course, when we get building in our locality, we don't make lots and lots of money. We generally tend to lose it. If somebody builds a house across with you, uh, or you get an enormous um, big estate of low quality uh, on the edge of your community, and your roads get overloaded, and your schools get overloaded, and your parking gets overloaded, you know, there is no upside. So generally, residents are saying no, um, and the government is hoping uh, for a yes, and indeed the government has instructed plan officers to um, to have a uh, a pro development bias. So when a planning officer is using their discretion, they have to be always trying to build. Whereas residents, when they use their discretion, tend always to try uh, to obstruct building. So that's the two separate mindsets, if you like, the two halves of the planning equation. And when the neighbourhood plan came along. I was a little surprised by it, and the reason I was surprised by it is that the government, who are desperate to build, um, uh, are apparently offering residents more say, more control in planning. And by and large, if somebody has a lot of uh, a lot to gain, if you like, from a particular outcome, they don't tend to fund things that would make that outcome less likely. So, if, for instance, Big Tobacco were backing a bill through the House of uh, Commons, you can know without even reading it. That it would benefit big tobacco. In the same way, if the government is bringing in some sweeping changes to planning, uh, it would be a lack of due diligence not to at least check to see that it wasn't actually a Trojan horse or um, streamlining planning, as they would refer to it. But since residents are the only real um, barrier to smooth planning, essentially a way of, of, of reducing residents' rights or reducing their ability uh, to interrupt planning application. So at the moment, on the pro side, the pro planning side, we have the government and the planning officer, who's the servant of the state. On the other side, we have the residents and the parish council. And by and large, if you ever see an application which is contentious, you'll find that it is the government and the planning officer who are looking to pass the application, and you'll find that it's the residents and the parish council who are looking to obstruct uh, the application. And the way it works out is that if the parish council and the residents are on the same page, then they have a very good chance of going to committee and having the planning officer's view set aside. It doesn't guarantee that they'll get the result they want, but it does mean that they've you know, um, had a go, if you like. And often when you go to committee, it's successful. So the big question is, will this new thing, this new neighbourhood plan, actually help you to get what you want out of planning? Because that's what it's offering, isn't it? It's your neighbourhood plan and give you a chance to have your say. And it, it gives the impression, the very strong impression, that your powers as residents will increase. So let's say if your usual involvement in planning is to, is to object to 90% of the things that come through, you'd expect in the neighbourhood plan works that you would be able to successfully object to a greater proportion of applications. Um, it would only be if it weakened your role in planning that it would actually lead to more development. Um, now this doesn't square with the government's promise that they will this year hit their targets of uh, 250,000 um, houses. But the way in which the, plan, uh, the neighbourhood plan works is like this. You have your primary legislation, which is here. This is the stuff that actually has bites made by the, um, the government of the day through a majority global parliament. We then have the secondary layer of uh, legislation, which is the, the local plan, which is made by the local council. The neighbourhood plan is a tertiary layer of legislation. It doesn't override this, and it doesn't override this. It pr it's supposed to provide a third sieve, if you like, so that the flower that comes through the top sieve and the second sieve, instead of there then being granted by the officer, then has to go through the third sieve. The idea is that you can put what you like in the third sieve, you can further refine, if you like, um, the way in which planning applications are dealt with, and in that way, uh, gain more control. But the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is something which is tucked away in the neighbourhood planning document, which you may or may not have noticed. And that's that in there, it says that from now on, if you vote for the neighbourhood plan, the parish council will endeavour to identify sites for development. Now I know that doesn't sound 
like mud.